All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Clarko Carmis. I am the executive director of the Alabama Campaign for Adolescent Sexual Health. I don't usually sound like this, but I have been sick for a couple of weeks and trying to get that sorted. So apologies for my voice. Fortunately, you don't have to hear me talk too much today. Um, I am very excited and happy to present um, Dr. Eric Goodcase. He is a professor at University of Alabama, as well as a therapist. And he's also a board member. So um, he's very uh, special to us at the Alabama campaign. He's also our newest board member. So we thought it would be fun to ask him to present on a webinar. Um, I'm so pleased to have him and I'm going to go ahead and turn the reins over to him um, here in just a second. I wanted to also mention um, if you have any comments or questions you'd like to share throughout, you can just drop them in the chat. Um, and Dr. Goodcase may also have some um, prompts for you throughout. So feel free to participate as much as you're comfortable. Um, and with that, it's off to you, Eric. Thank you so much for the introduction. I, I wasn't, I didn't know this was initiation for the board, but that is. Uh, yeah, it's not, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to mention real quick before I start that my wife is very pregnant and if um, uh, if I get that call this will end immediately and that will be the end of the talk but hopefully that doesn't happen so we have enough time to get through all this. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about sexual assault this uh, for sexual assault awareness month and um, before I get into the be to the material that I want to cover, I do want to just kind of say that if you are a survivor of sexual assault or, you know, even someone who has worked with survivors of sexual assault, um, you know, we're going to be talking about um, a handful of topics, kind of defining sexual assault. We're going to talk about like myths that exist and different like um, uh, narratives that we see either in the media or through people that we know. Um, and uh, some, we're gonna have a kind of a call to arms at the end. So if any of those things might be um, difficult or bring up um, tr uh, trauma symptoms in some way, just kind of like, you know, by all means, feel free to like exit out, obviously, uh, but even just kind of like, you know, having something ready in terms of grounding techniques or breathing techniques or something that you've done before that could be helpful, or again, or just like click off of here and, you know, you can watch uh, the recording later or you can just kind of, um, take whatever time you need to take care of yourself. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we're kind of gonna start off with just some kind of like quick um, definitional type stuff. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this because I really wanna hit on the cultural narratives um, and the what can we do about it part. Cause those are the, to me, those are the two big pieces that I wanna spend the most of the time on. Uh, but I do wanna make sure that we're kind of defining things before we get into it. Uh, so sexual assault is any kind of unwanted um, sexual um, either harassment or, or through words or touch um, all the way up to violent assault. Um, so it's any kind of non-consensual sex and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna define um, consent in a second here. Um, but I wanna just be very clear that we're talking about a continuum here. Um, so it can be all the way from you know, harassment or um, inappropriate comments or, or, or jokes um, in the wrong context, especially persistent. Um, uh, harassment all the way up until violent assault. And it's not to say that there is assault that's like worse than others. Um, there are some uh, indications that, you know, maybe more violent assault might be more likely to lead to PTSD um, for survivors, but um, any sexual assault is, um, you know, it can be traumatic and can be very difficult. And obviously um, is what we're, we're talking about all of that today. So we have pretty high rates of sexual assault in the United States. So there's estimates, usually the estimates you see are between 20 and 25%. Uh, you'll see a huge range of statistics if you go to look this up, uh, because again, the definition that different studies use varies a lot. So some don't include harassment, um, some only include maybe penetrative sexual assault, um, but 20, 25% seems to be kind of a, a more common estimate that I've seen in terms of uh, sexual assault. I think if we included harassment and things like that, it'd be a little bit higher, uh, but this is kind of what you typically see. And the big thing that I wanna get across as we go forward um, for this presentation is that sexual assault as a systemic issue is a cultural thing. You may have heard the term rape culture before, and that's one of the big things that I wanna make sure we're really uh, talking about cultures in which um, 
Uh, we see uh, more male dominance cultures in which we see higher levels of interpersonal violence, especially violence towards women, are typically cultures that have higher rates of sexual assault. So if we can look at different cultures, if we can look at different countries and see, okay, this country, this country, this country, they have different rates of sexual assault. And many of that is kind of related to how we view men and women, how we view violence. Um, we can start to uncover the fact that this is a cultural issue. I think, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of times we like to just kind of like use the bad apples argument, which is a few bad apples committing assault. When really this is a cultural issue, it is, even if we just compare the sexual assault rate here in the United States to Canada, to the North, we have a much higher rate of sexual assault. Um, and we can, you know, we can brainstorm in terms of why that might be, um, but just the fact that we are, you know, somewhat seen as similar in terms of culture, but we do have cultural differences. Um, and those cultural differences have a higher rate of sexual assault for the United States. So it's something to think about as we're going forward. Um, so I want to also define consent since we're saying that, you know, um, uh, um, sexual assault is sexual uh, touch or behavior, inappropriate comments that occur without consent. We need to know what consent is. Uh, and the common kind of narrative around consent has always been no means no, right? That's probably something that almost everyone has heard if they've heard anything related to consent. Uh, but there's more to it. Uh, than we often talk about. So consent needs to be explicit, which means it just needs to be very clear. Usually this means verbal. Um, you know, if you're with someone for a really long time and you have certain very clear signals, then yeah, that's probably still explicit consent. Um, however, especially for new relationships or new situations, you really want it to be verbal. So it's very clear. It needs to be very clear. Uh, and affirmative. So this, this is not the presence of a yes, not the absence of a no. So throw out no means no and bring in, there needs to be the presence of a yes. Um, so if a person doesn't respond, they didn't say no, but that's not consent. Consent needs to be explicit and affirmative. A couple other things to um, note needs to be ongoing. Uh, consent at the beginning of a sexual encounter does not give consent for anything and every behavior that could possibly happen afterwards. We need to check in, see how things are going. If a person's starting to feel uncomfortable or is in pain, um, you don't get to continue because they said consent at the beginning. They said yes at the beginning. You check in, see how they're doing. Um, it needs to be mutual. All parties involved need to give consent. It's not just one uh, party or multiple or uh, less parties than everyone involved. Uh, and the last point between competent individuals, this just has to do with age. So the age of consent um, is that uh, different in different states, but need to be of age. Um, uh, not under any influence of substances, alcohol, drugs, other things. Um, this also goes for people with intellectual disabilities. So if a person's intellectual capacity is not that of an adult, uh, even if um, chronologically they're a certain age, if their uh, mental age isn't quite at that point, that also cannot give consent. Um, the other thing I just want to note really quick before I move on is there's this idea that I've seen here and there about consent being like a mood killer. Um, and one, I don't think you're asking for consent, right? But there's lots of ways to ask for consent and incorporate consent into like, you know, normal sexual conversation where it's not a mood killer. So um, a really easy one to think about. So if you think about ongoing consent, you wouldn't necessarily just say like, oh, do you consent to me continuing with this behavior in the middle of intercourse? Cause uh, your partner might think you're a little strange if you do that, but you might check in with things like, does that feel good? Or how does it, how is that? Or things like that stuff that like, should be in kind of incorporated in kind of like general sexual communication to make sure everyone's having a good time. Uh, but that's also a good check-in for consent and things like that. So again, consent, um, you know, there is kind of a consent is sexy or consent can be sexy kind of like counter movement to this idea of um, consent breaking the mood, but you just have to like bring it into what you're already doing, right? Like if you already know um, the process of what things look like and what, you know, if it's a new partner or an old partner, just making sure that you're asking for consent at the beginning and then getting the ongoing consent through checking in. And again, that could just be a lot of the normal sexual communication that happens with some, with just like making sure everything's okay. So I'm kind of glossing over consent more than I would normally like to, but the things that I really want to spend the time on are the things that are coming up. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Also, I don't know if anyone's seen the T video that's on YouTube about consent, but they do a very kind of like fun, um, uh, and, and very clear job of defining, you know, why consent is important and, and how that looks. Um, so I wanted to spend a lot of my time, again, talking about 
one, these kind of myths or narratives, uh, and then talking about what are we gonna do about sexual assault in the community? So sexual assault, we're just gonna hit these myths. These are things that we hear a lot or we might see in different ways. Um, sexual assault is not a result of misunderstanding. Um, does that happen occasionally? Possibly. Um, you know, there are all these rules around consent. Maybe it's just that someone doesn't know the rules around consent. And what the literature has kind of shown is that it's not the case. For the most part, people who are committing sexual assault, um, even if they're justifying their behavior in some way, um, they, they are doing it in a way that's kind of neglecting the needs of the other person. So um, kind of thinking about consent again, um, sometimes I get questions when I teach the class, like what if both people are drinking or whatever, things like that. And the biggest thing that I think of is like, if you're worried about what's legal and what's not legal, um, to me, that's, that's an important question, but not the most important question when it comes to consent. The most important question is, are you taking the other person's um, other person's needs into account? Are you, do you have your best, the other person's best interests in account? So sexual assault is not something that usually happens because, oh, I didn't know it was happening. Um, or, oh, I wasn't sure what they were saying. That's not usually the case. Usually it's more um, insidious than that. It's, uh, we, we, let, we might like to think that sometimes it happens out of a misunderstanding or like, oh, um, you know, what a, did, did you really say that? Or did you really, maybe they misheard you? That's not usually what happens. Usually it's a, a lot more um, um, intentional. Um, and again, not taking the other person's um, needs or um, viewpoint into account. Uh, and this one seems obvious that sexual assault is never justified, but it is certainly something that plays out in those cultural narratives, right? So we see a lot of uh, victim blaming narratives that come out. What was that person wearing is a very common one. Why did that person go home with that person? Um, why is it that, um, you know, why weren't they walking home by themselves or whatever the case might be? We have these kind of like narratives of like, hmm, did they play some role in this? Is this something that they contributed to in some way? And that's not the case, right? So um, sexual assault is never justified. It's never explained. This is also something that you might see um, narratives. And again, you don't see this in uh, narratives in regards to like media or things like that, but it's certainly something you've heard around. If a person says no, that really means that they need you to convince them. And again, that's not, um, that's coercion. That's not, how things work. So if a person says no, that's no. Um, if a person doesn't answer, that's also a no. So there's no justification for, um, well, they said no, but they really meant yes. That is, a, that, is a, that is a cultural narrative that still exists at this point. And again, that's a very harmful narrative uh, and one that we should be uh, fighting back against if we ever hear it. This one, um, was one that personally drives me crazy. So I wanna make sure that I'm putting it. Uh, sexual assault is not a result of uncontrollable sexual desires. It's not that someone is just so out of control um, aroused that they can't help themselves. That's not why sexual assault happens. Um, sexual assault happens because of power and control. It's a, it's, it's a power and control tactic over another person. Um, we as human beings have, you know, control over our sexual desires for the most part. Um, this is why you don't see people just randomly breaking into sex in the streets because um, we have self-control. We don't ever, you know, th th that's not a valid excuse for um, sexual assault. It's not a result of uncontrolled desire. It's not a boys will be boys situation or just like, oh, men can't help themselves because that's a narrative around men, right? That they have such uncontrollable sexual desires they can't help themselves. Uh, where well, that's not the case. That is not why sexual assault happens. Uh, and it's not justification for sexual assault that happens. This is another one that I see very commonly because I think of how we see it in the media. Um, sexual assault is not usually committed by psychopathic strangers. That's kind of the stereotype that we might think of when it comes to a perpetrator of sexual assault, a psychopath jumping out of the shadows and, and kidnapping someone for sexual assault. That is not usually how it happens. Do those stories exist? Yes, they do. Uh, there's stories of people breaking into houses and those kinds of things. Those things do occur. Um, however, most sexual assault is committed by someone that the survivor knows. So usually it's a friend or an, a, a casual acquaintance. Um, it is a romantic partner or a spouse. 
uh, it is um, a date person's going on or someone they met at the um, at a, at a bar or at a party or things like that. Usually it's a person that the, some, that the survivor knows in some way. Um, not only that, but usually a person who is a perpetrator is seen by others as not capable of committing that act. So this is, you know, this is a, a, a thing that's almost inherently planned, right? So it's an idea of like, whenever a person's accused, many times people say like, oh, it couldn't be that person. That person's a nice person. That person's a good person. And what, what some research has found is, is that oftentimes perpetrators are seen as nice people. They're seen as like nice guys. Uh, we'll talk about the, the gender component in a second here because I haven't touched on that um, as much. Um, they're seen as nice people. They're usually kind of like well-liked and popular. Um, however, um, some of the warning signs potentially could be individuals who just don't take rejection well. That oftentimes um, is a, is a um, indicator, not, not an indicator of someone who commits uh, assault, but people who uh, are perpetrators have, often have that trait in common, if that makes sense. Uh, and often have kind of misogynistic views around uh, women as well. So those are kind of like warning signs-ish. But again, usually people who perpetrate sexual assault are seen as nice people or good people outside. They're not people that act like um, a rapist all the time. They're not someone who looks like that because that's not something that is, you know, they've, if they're thinking about how to get away with things, they're not going to act like all the time. Same thing with like um, lots of, you know, maybe true crime or sometimes people see where it's like, oh, they had no idea this person was that person. It's like, yeah, because they're not walking around telling people that they're, they're, they commit crimes. They're acting normal and then they commit crimes at these certain um, times. This is also kind of the narrative you'll see pop up around certain um, situations. So um, the Brock Turner case being a very famous example of someone who was like seen as a very nice person, this great swimmer and great student. Um, and because of that, people were surprised that someone like that would commit sexual assault. And, and that's not the case. People, the majority of sexual assaults again, are committed by someone that the survivor knows. And oftentimes it's someone who's seen as not capable of doing that because again, they don't want to get caught. Um, and I know this is something that I, I'm gonna, I, I, I debated on whether I was gonna say this or not, but it's just something that I think needs to be said sometimes in terms of how we think about this. A lot of times I've been to either presentations around sexual assault or discussions around sexual assault uh, and they tell you to like picture three most important or four most important uh, women in your life. Now think about one of those people being assaulted. Um, and I think we need to start looking at the other way too. Um, and just think about some people in your life um, and someone, again, maybe not like best friends or family members, but think about those people. Um, and, you know, now think about what, how would you react if they were accused of sexual assault? If someone accused them. Um, and again, that, that makes things a lot more complicated. It's really easy for us to say um, something about Brock Turner um, or other people that have been accused or things like that, but it might be more difficult for someone who knew Brock Turner or whatever, even though, again, the, the evidence was very clear, obviously, um, uh, but just something to kind of think about as well. Um, sexual assault is really difficult to report for a number of reasons. Um, so the first, being that how a person who is a survivor of sexual assault, how the other people respond to them is directly related to their well being later on. So, if a person is victim blamed, if they're not believed, if they're treated as if uh, it's a burden, um, that's actually more likely to bring on post traumatic stress symptoms later on um, than if a person is believed and treated well and their emotions are validated, all those kinds of things. Um, so there's a lot riding on this, like, difficulty. it's a very difficult thing to disclose to another person, and the risk is really high, right? Because sometimes, you know, even well-meaning professionals or friends uh, might respond in ways that are um, inappropriate or victim-blaming without them thinking about it. Um, so it's really hard to kind of, like, come forward and disclose that. And that's, you know, for professionals, that's disclosing to friends. It's a really difficult thing to do because, again, it can be re-traumatizing to grow, go through a situation like that. Um, also of note, uh, in terms of difficult to report, um, when a person reports, they're oftentimes um, re-victimized in terms of kind of uh, 
almost like, I, this is too strong of language, but almost like revenge for um, uh, reporting. So people might um, uh, turn on a person who reports. I can't believe you try to ruin this accuser or the, the perpetrator's life. I can't believe you would um, take this forward. I can't believe you're doing this to this person, even though again, the, they're the survivor and people are saying that to them. Um, there's also lots of um, narratives in like the media, especially in like high profile cases. So we often hear um, narratives like, oh, that person's just trying to get money. That person is just trying to hurt this um, famous athlete or politician or celebrity's name. That's all they're doing this for. It's not for anything else. And it does a backlash. So again, if we think about a recent example, um, uh, 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 Dr. Blasey Ford, whose first name I'm, I'm blanking on, Christine Blasey Ford. Okay, um, when she um, uh, talked to, in front of uh, Congress about uh, 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 Justice Kavanaugh, um, she received a lot of death threats and things like that. So again, there's lots of backlash towards someone who um, uh, comes forward. Um, and I'm trying to think, um, that backlash is, really juxtaposed. I can't remember if I'm, I'm going to talk about this later or not. So, okay, yeah, I'm going to talk about it now. <laughs> I just was like, where is my organization here? Um, really juxtaposed against this idea that we've seen in terms of perpetrators, um, in terms of like the, the ruining their life, right? So there's this idea that um, accusing someone of sexual assault is ruining their life or in the case of Brock Turner, even though he was convicted, the judge was worried about ruining his life, so gave him a very light sentence, which is not a narrative you see for other crimes. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a story about a judge who was like, you know what, you made a mistake um, dealing drugs, but uh, you know, I don't wanna ruin your life by putting you in jail. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Um, same thing with like murder. I don't think everyone was like, you know, you made a mistake by murdering that person, but I don't wanna ruin your life. We don't have that, that narrative doesn't exist for other crimes. Um, and I think if we, you know, in the Brock Turner case, I think there's a racial component too, but that's that's a whole different story. Um, but we also see this in terms of um, this idea around, I'm not gonna get into cancel culture and that's a whole other thing that people have been talking about a lot, um, but even just kind of these narratives around that, it's like, oh, it's going to ruin this person's career. It's going to ruin their reputation. And again, that's typically not the case. I mean. Um, we could go through a whole list of individuals who were accused of sexual assault um, um, or, or convicted or whatever, and you know are still kind of living their lives or making millions of dollars playing football or other things. So the other big thing that I wanna talk about is oftentimes sexual assault is talked about as just a women's issue. And there's a couple of reasons why this is important to fight back against this narrative. One, um, men can also be uh, survivors of sexual assault. So most sexual assault that we see or that uh, exists is male perpetration, female survivor. Um, there's also uh, male perpetration uh, on male, uh, female perpetration on female, female perpetration male also exists. It's far less common. Uh, but a lot of times there are different narratives that exist for males um, in regards to uh, this idea that a man can't be sexually assaulted because of um, the arousal things that would have to take place. If a person's aroused, that means they must have wanted sex, and that's not the case. So if a person shows sign of arousal, that does not mean that they desire sex. So if a person has an erection, that does not mean they want to have sex necessarily. Um, so desire and arousal, different concepts. So they're related, but different concepts. So arousal, we're talking about physiological body symptoms. Desire, we're talking about kind of the mental want for sex. So a person can have arousal, they can have um, physiological um, responses. So this could be you know, erection, this could be lubrication, whatever the case might be, but that does not indicate desire. And sometimes, again, for male or female, um, or uh, non-binary or just any, anyone, um, those arousal symptoms sometimes make it confusing in terms of thinking about, so this is especially true for um, male survivors of sexual assault. So. Um, it feels, uh, I've had people describe to us, it, it, it feels wrong, but I don't know what to call it um, because how can it be sexual assault if I was um, aroused or how do I 
make sense of what happened to me. And sometimes that uh, ambiguity can be especially difficult. So sexual assault is not just a woman's issue. Men can certainly be um, survivors of sexual assault. And it's not just a woman's issue in the sense that it's a cultural issue. So just when we talked about earlier, um, this is not something, again, it's not just a few bad eggs. It's not just psychopathic strangers. This is a cultural issue. Because it's a cultural issue, we all have a role to play. And that is what I'm going to talk about next. So sexual assault is a cultural problem. It's something that is, uh, rape culture exists. So if that is true, because we are all a part of the culture, we can start to make changes in that culture. So this is my call to arms for all of us. This is us thinking about what is it that we can do to start to make changes in our culture that would decrease sexual assault? How do we make this change happen? So a couple of different um, suggestions. So I have a whole slide for learning how to support survivors because I think this is really important. So if someone ever discloses sexual assault to you, um, remember that the way you respond is really important for their long-term mental health. And here are some really important um, uh, guidelines, I guess, for how to respond in a situation where a person discloses sexual assault to you, especially discloses that they were sexually assaulted. Um, so number one, believe them. Be, uh, believing them when they're, what they're saying to you is one of the most important things. Um, again, even if there's something in your brain that uh, making you feel skeptical, you're not, you're not a police officer. You're not investigating. It's not your job. Believe them. Communicate that to them that you believe them. It's so important to their long-term health that just by believing them, you're doing something um, positive for their, um, for their mental health long-term. Uh, you want to validate their emotions. Uh, people who are survival of sexual assault, especially if it's, if it's recent, uh, might be going through lots of different experiences. Um, they might um, feel numb, they might feel angry, they might feel sad, they might feel all sorts of ways. Um, and validating their emotions is really important. So when I say validating emotions, I don't say confirm their emotions. And that's really important too, because sometimes people have that feeling like, it feels like it's my fault. You don't want to validate that emotion by saying, yes, it's your fault, obviously. But you do want to validate, you know, it's very common to feel that way, or it's, it's normal to feel that way. It's okay that you feel that way um, before kind of saying it's not your fault. So you want to validate that what they're feeling is normal or okay. There's nothing wrong with them for feeling however they feel. Um, and again, if they do kind of express the feelings around fault, you still include that it's not their fault. You still say that, but valid, make sure you're validating their emotions too. Um, avoid showing your own emotions. It is very tempting um, to be angry or upset or think about um, the perpetrator, especially if it's someone you know or someone that you trust in. Um, however, your anger or your reaction doesn't do anything for the survivor. Um, you, what you don't want to happen is for them to start feeling like they have to take care of you or they have to stop telling you things so they don't want to make you more upset. Even if you ha are having a really strong emotional response, which again, which would be, incre which would be a very normal human response, doing your best to kind of show your, uh, avoid showing your emotions and just be there for them is important. Is that easier said than done? Sure. Um, but just kind of like doing your best to be there for them in that moment as much as possible is really important. Another really important one that's kind of hard to swallow sometimes is don't coax them into action. Sometimes if we're a support person or if we're a friend, we're thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we report this? How do we make sure that this person pays for what they did? How do we make sure this perpetrator um, doesn't ever do this to someone else again? Let's take action. Let's get you to the hospital. Uh, let's get you examined. Let's make sure um, nothing happened in terms of STI or pregnancy. Let's, let's take care of this. Um, however, um, for some people who are survivors, they're just, again, they're just not there, uh, if, if it, especially if it's really uh, fresh. Um, and the thing that I always say in the situation is you don't want to coax them or force them into action because that's literally what just happened to them. So you don't want to re-victimize them by 
forcing them or making them uncomfortable to doing something else. You can provide support, be there for them, say you'll be there. You can offer the idea or the opportunity, but don't push. Because once that pushing or coaxing comes in, you're really you're getting really close to that re-victimizing situation where a person's going to feel um, uh, going to feel coerced again, and that's not what you want in the situation. And again, that's that's really hard because we know that the sooner they get to the hospital, the better. And we know that um, uh, things like conviction of sexual assault is incredibly difficult. It just it's an incredibly low rate of conviction for sexual assault. Uh, but in the sooner you report and the sooner if, there's, if there is any physical evidence, the better. Uh, but you, you just don't want to do that to the person long term. Because again, disclosure is really difficult. Reporting is really difficult. Um, and e again, even really well-meaning professionals sometimes can, um, uh, can re-victimize. Can, can, and again, if, if a person feels re-victimized or feels um, victim blamed or feels like they're not being validated or believed, um, those are the kinds of things that are, can lead more likely to PTSD, uh, and that's not what we want. Um, so something to be aware of. So these are, these are all the different things to kind of keep in mind. So believe them, validate their emotions, stay with them, don't coax them into action. Again, if they, if they do support, it gets really hard. This reporting it is really difficult, really hard. Be there for them. You need, if you're there for them, you can be the person that's there for them, the support when Again, a well, maybe a well-meaning, I, I, I'm very optimistic, a well-meaning professional is doing their best, but maybe says something that can be um, triggering in some way. If you can be that support person there with them, that can mitigate some of that response. So if I have some support, maybe I'm not as affected by someone saying something that might be victim blaming or things like that. Other things that we can do, learn how to talk about sexual assault, especially around these kind of big profile cases, right? So even just kind of bringing in this idea that, um, you know, oftentimes we hear things about like, oh, um, there are so many false accusations because people are just trying to make money. Have that conversation with someone, you know, you, you know, the numbers show that there is very few false accusations. They do occur, it is something that has happened, um, but it's, it's very rare and it's far more likely for a person who has been assaulted to not disclose and for like a made up um, accusation to happen. So talking about that with people, you know, engaging people in the conversation around um, these kind of big high profile cases or even just something that happens uh, in general, just, just having those conversations around those things. Uh, also just being mindful of the language we use, I think is really important. So this is a really small thing and you know I don't think it's changing the world or anything but I do think that the way we talk about sex in terms of male female sex um, oftentimes gets very bogged down in um, uh, someone doing something to another person so even when we're talking about consensual sex we might say like he screwed her or something like that um, and we're literally saying that someone is doing something to another person instead of with another person and for me, I think that's a really big difference. So if we can start to have conversations around um, sex being something that's done mutually or with two people, as opposed to one thing to another, you know, just the different language we use around that, I think that can be really helpful in terms of just kind of like um, changing some of the narratives around consent. And again, like bringing up consent and having conversations around consent, um, uh, what that means and why, um, alcohol, a person who's um, been drinking or under the influence of drugs can't give consent. Why a person, um, uh, you know, might be consenting to some behavior, but you know, consenting to other behaviors, getting people to think about ongoing consent, having all these conversations with people and not being afraid to broach the topic is very important. Um, educate about consent early. This is the thing that I think is really important. So even before we're educating children about what sexual intercourse is or what sex is or whatever, we need to be educating about consent. So this is talking about things like body autonomy, respecting one's own and others' body autonomy, meaning kind of, um, uh, you know, a really good example of this is, have you ever seen a little kid go up to another little kid and give them a big hug? Uh, the other kid's like inching away from it because they don't want it. You know, it's, it's well-intentioned, it's cute because they're children, but we want to like start to teach about like, you know, like that's not what that person wanted. You need to ask to give someone a hug. 
Um, you need to make sure if that's something that they want. Um, this is even things around um, uh, um, uh, good touch, bad touch. So like not hitting all those kinds of things that you would teach a child, all really important um, and stuff that you're probably normally think. But again, this is where we, we wanna make sure this is important. We're not getting into some of those narratives that exist, boys will be boys. Um, it, it is pretty harmful or this idea of like if a person's being mean or hitting or teasing you that that's um, a sign that they like you. That's pretty harmful narrative that exists uh, for some reason that I don't understand. Um, but again, just thinking about consent at an early age, even before we're thinking about sex. Um, so just thinking about body autonomy. So um, another good example of this is, you know, it's, it's becoming more um, common for parents to, if a, if a, um, to give kids the right to kind of refuse a hug from grandma, a hug from aunt or uncle, or things like that, just to kind of give them um, uh, autonomy over their body. Again, making sure that they learn to respect others' autonomy. If the other person doesn't want a hug, you don't give them a hug. Um, no hitting, all those kinds of things. Uh, and even, uh, and obviously it's also a good touch, bad touch also, you know, encompasses what parts are, you know, their privates, your genitals, um, you know, who talks about that, um, who's, who touches that, just the parents, doctor, you kind of a thing. Um, and um, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention that's, that's escaping me for the moment. And not only, but in, in using proper terms. Uh, using proper terms for genitalia as well, because again, you don't want to send the signal that it's not something that's supposed to be talked about, um, because then they won't bring it to you if something does happen, or even if it's something that's like medical or something wrong. Uh, sometimes kids feel shame or doubt or not sure what to talk or that it's okay to talk about, and then don't bring something up and let a medical issue get worse, um, or don't talk about something that could be um, problematic. So educating about consent early, one, you know, protecting kids, but also getting them to think about respecting others as well. So I want to handle, uh, Christina, I saw your question as well. Do you have a good way to talk about consent to people who are both under the influence of substances? So yeah, so for me, um, when people get, when I get questions that are kind of bogged down in details or kind of, um, you know, what is the, you know, what about this situation? What about this situation? A lot of times my response is, you know, is everyone involved really, um, taking the other person's best interests. Um, so if two people have been together a really long time and they happen to have a few drinks together and they engage in some sexual behavior and it's all with each other's best interests, they talk all through it, they gave consent, um, is that something that should be uh, punished by law? No, you know, that's not necessarily helpful in, the, in discussions around consent. Um, and that's where it kind of gets, difficult for me because there are some things that, you know, might be technically legal if they're following certain laws or like covering their bases, but if they're not, um, if they're not taking the other person's um, well-being into account with their actions, that's really problematic. So a really good example of this, for those who are familiar with the Trevor Bauer case, the baseball player, um, they had engaged in a lot of conversation around engaging in, um, rather rough sexual behavior. That was something that they both wanted. However, based on the um, details, and again, I won't, I won't say those details, you can look it up if you'd like. Based on those details, it was pretty clear that it's, again, if the accusations are true, um, that he was not taking the person's well-being into account with his actions. So again, even though they had consent around um, rough behavior, maybe technically because that exists and there's, you know, there's text message um, about them wanting to engage in rough behavior, you know, maybe technically, they could make the argument that that's not assault based on law definition, but clearly the person, again, if the accusations are true, did not take their partner's well-being into account and put them in danger. So that's, I think, a really important conversation to have when you're teaching about this in terms of like, what does consent look like? So you're teaching teenagers or anyone like that. If you're getting bogged down in the what's legal, what's not, I think that's, again, it's an important conversation, but not the conversation to have. The conversation to have is, what are you doing to make sure that all people involved, um, everything's in their best interests, if that makes sense. Um, educate others. So um, we kind of talked about this with the talking about it with others, um, but just there's a lot of these narratives, those myths exist, all the victim blame myths, what was the person wearing? Uh, what did they do to bring that on? 
um, the ideas around it being just a strangers and bushes jumping out, um, that that person could never possibly, all these narratives that exist, that there's lots of false accusations, all these narratives that exist, hopefully you now know, or you did know, or you're thinking about how these things, how these kind of commonly thought things are problematic and not true. And you can take this out with you into the world where you see these um, narratives. So um, sharing the T YouTube video with others, or if someone bring, makes a comment, bringing up facts you've learned around sexual assault, or even just kind of like starting a conversation, making a post on social media. I think that people like to rip on social media a lot or say it's not helpful or whatever, but like what a great opportunity to reach a lot of people with the things that you know, you know, maybe it's um, for sexual assault awareness month, or maybe it's something like that. And again, you're not looking to like change the world necessarily, but if you can, if one person reads it and starts to think about things differently, you're starting to make change. So using your opportunities that you have and the voice that you have and the opportunities that you have to educate others about these topics. Um, be an intelligent consumer. Um, the, we have power in how we spend our money and what we click on, what we watch, what we um, do, what, who we vote for. All those things gives us some power and doesn't feel like a lot of power, right? Like we don't turn the TV on and be like, yes, power to CBS. But um, we do have that power in influencing the things around us. And again, it doesn't feel like a lot, but be an intelligent consumer. If there's a news program or um, uh, a, a group or a company that's engaging in certain things or a particular person that's engaged in behaviors, don't give that place money um, if that's something that you're trying to stand up for. So this is not just for sexual assault, but I like to think about it for everything. You know, put your money and attention and things that you wanna see continue in the world and take your money and attention away from things you don't wanna see in the world. Um, and then calling out problematic behaviors. This is one of the hardest ones. Um, so being a, you know, the bystander intervention is something that um, people can get trainings on. Um, it's not easy to do if anyone's been in that situation. Um, and this can range from a number of things. This can range from you, know, you seeing something that looks like it could be leading to sexual assault. So a person putting something in a drink or dragging someone out of the bar or party or things like that. Um, those are really obvious situations. Um, still very hard to intervene. But even in situations where a person makes an offhand comment or an offhand joke, um, not really realizing the, um, the impact that could be having on survivors or on the general um, conversation around sexual assault, calling those out is really important. And again, it is harder than it sounds. Just like, oh yeah, if someone makes a joke, just say, you know, just say that's not funny or, or uh, say something back or educate back. It's really hard in the moment, especially if it's, it's a family member or a friend, you don't want to like start something, but like, these are the ways that we can start to make change. We can fight back on these little narratives. We can fight back on um, inappropriate comments or jokes. We can fight back on the culture that exists that perpetuates sexual assault. Uh, we need to take those opportunities when they come. So call those things out. Uh, if you have the opportunity to um, say something, um, take advantage of those situations. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest ones and it's probably the hardest as well. So that's kind of where I wanted to leave us in terms of if we have questions or want to discuss other things. I had to, you know, I had to cram a lot into time. So there's some things we didn't quite get to. So if you want me to spend more time talking about something or if you wanted to bring up another topic that you think is important for this that needs to be talked about, by all means. Um, so this, it says questions, but really it's questions or comments. If you have any other thoughts or things that you want to bring in, uh, by all means, um, I, I'd love to hear it slash read it in chat. Hey, Eric. So I also dropped a few, um, just while we're waiting for people to respond to your prompt, I dropped a few things in the chat as you were talking. Um, the tea video, if anyone hasn't seen it, I know if you've been to one of our trainings, um, you may have seen it. It's one of my favorite resources. Um, and one that can be shared with younger people. As long as you get the, um, the version that I sent, there's also an explicit version that has some um, language that some people may not be comfortable with. Um, I always forget so, there's an explicit version when I show up in my class until it happens. Yeah, <laughs> so I know. I, and I think the version I that has the bad language is, um, I think it says explicit, but I'm not sure. 
So you might I think wanna... it, I can't remember. I think it does too, but I I, compl- I always forget when I show it in class that there's a there's an F bomb in there. Yeah, I know. So you may want to just view it before you show it to anybody. Um, yes. <laughs> you mentioned the Brock Turner case several times. Um, of course, I had heard of that case for years and years, but I wasn't till I read the book um, "Say My Name" by Chanel Miller, who was the survivor um, of the assault of the rape in that book, uh, or I'm sorry, in that case. Um, and she just tells it's it's such a powerful story um, how you know everything leading up to that moment and everything that happened after it and not just the way the justice system handled her case and the you know injustice of his sentencing but also the the psychological trauma that was left after and that impacted her relationships after and impacted her life after. Um, I very much encourage anybody who is interested um, in this topic to read that book. Um, Definitely. And then, yeah, I mean, just to, you'd mentioned about social media. Oftentimes we think, you know, what good is that going to do? Virtue signaling, those signs of things. But you can really change the minds of people um, just in your close network of friends and family, um, or at least start a conversation that may not have happened anyway. I know. For my family, now that I have a child, I'm a huge advocate. I mean, I always was, but now especially a huge advocate of bodily autonomy and consent um, for touching bodies. And um, that was not something that my parents would have understood, um, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. But when my daughter had a child uh, six years ago, she really implemented that. And it's very much a rule in the family now and everybody understands it. Um, and even when we were visiting with family this past week, um, there were some family members who, you know, would grab her up to hug her or who would just kind of like tickle her or whatever. And she was clearly uninterested. And I would just say, hey, she doesn't like that. You know, like, let's stop. And um, it's uncomfortable in the moment. But, you know, as a parent, I think, you know, a lot of people on here may be able to to um, relate just as a parent, you, you always are looking for your child's best interest. And um, it becomes a little bit easier when you're parents to stand up for for them in that moment. So um, yeah, I just wanna shut up so other people can talk if they need to. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can come off mute as well if, if you'd rather speak than type. And thank you, Janine. I appreciate it. Hopefully I'm saying that right also. Yeah, I feel like this was full of so many great things and thank you for the call to action as well. Um, I think that's really important for us to, to be able to know what you know next steps are for us, for those of us that are advocates for this, um, for this work. And it's something that I always like to include in the sense of, it feels like such an insurmountable problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And it feels like it's something that we can do nothing about. And you know what? If you make a post on social media, you have a conversation, you call it a joke, it doesn't always feel like, hey, I'm changing the world. But those are the things that can start to make change. And again, it, it doesn't feel like, hey, I'm fixing this insurmountable problem, but it's, it's, it's a small step in doing so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had this huge case a couple of years ago with Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and just watching that and, and being there in support of her to view the, the testimony and, um, you know, indicating that we, you know, I know I indicated on social media that I believed her and that I was in support of her. Um, I think that makes a big difference actually, because, because, victims are so often called to question. And I think just to say, no, I believe her. Um, I believe her story and not calling that into question is powerful. Definitely. And I'd be remiss if we didn't mention the Me Too movement just because it's something that started here in Selma, Alabama. And that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, Toronto Birch starting that here. So um, I didn't have uh, further <laughs> thoughts on it, but I just think that's, I, I always include something related to that in, um, in my class, because you know, we think about it. Um, you know, it got much more popular with the Harvey Weinstein case and Melissa Milano making posts. But it really, you know, it started here in Selma, Alabama, with um, 
uh, Toronto Burke advocating for survivors and just them or her realizing that so many people felt alone um, in being survivors and felt like it was, you know, um, something unique to them, but just like having a community um, built to kind of like be there for each other was important. I didn't know that started in Selma. Thank you for, yeah, yeah I'm going to look, do some more research into that. Yeah, um, it's, a, um, it's a very, it's a very cool story. If you read up on um, uh, Toronto Burke stuff. Um, that's great. Um, Linda had sent me a direct message that I think it's okay to share um, that we need more training with law enforcement, local ERs and hospitals, mental health um, folks, adult daycare for special needs, adults, um, and the list could go on and on. Yes, we absolutely need more training for all those people. Um, and, and I'm sure they've had a number of trainings, but I mean, I, I don't think it can be overemphasized because Absolutely. we're still living in the culture that we live in and there's still problems mm -hmm. with all these systems. So obviously we need and to it, continue to have those trainings. And it's really hard too. I, you know, I think about this from a perspective of a law enforcement officer, a person working in a medical facility in terms of like, you know, there are certain questions that you'd want to ask in order to get more information. Um, and the goal of getting more information sometimes is antithetical to being there for the person. Um, you know, not always, sometimes those things go together, but sometimes it doesn't. And just, you know, how do you navigate those situations and the trainings for individuals in those situations and, and how, to, how to have those conversations, I think is really important. Yeah, you almost need a, a special victims advocate in every situation, you know, almost, you know, hospital needs that, you know, a law enforcement police force needs them. They really need these specialists who can at least be there when the questioning is happening to yeah. let that person know, like, I'm here for you, regardless of the question or, you know, whatever, um, I believe you and, and I um, can affirm your feelings. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's, it's just, it's, it's tricky. I don't think, I don't think these systems are set up for that right now. And so we do need more attention paid. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, um, I'm not seeing anybody else come off, off their mic um, or put anything in the chat. So I think we're probably about done. Um, I just wanna thank you so much, Eric. This was great. Um, I feel like I learned something new, even though I've been in this work for years and years, every time I hear a sexual assault prevention um, presentation. So thank you so much for, for giving us your, um, your information that you have. And um, I will be sending out a recording to everyone who registered um, by the end of the week. So if you're here, you'll get a recording. If you have a colleague who registered, you'll get a recording and you can feel free to share those recordings as well. Um, Eric, will you be able to share your slides? Yes, I can do that, yes. Okay, great. So we'll also have a copy of the slides um, available to share and you can share that with your colleagues as well. Um, and if ever, you decide that you need a uh, specialized training for your fields, please let us know. Um, we can either connect you with the right person to do that, or perhaps we can do that ourselves, depending on the topic. Um, we certainly want to be a resource for you and your colleagues and your communities. So please let us know. And That's I have more that. detailed information somewhere uh, for some of these things too. You know, I kept it kind of like, you know, splash on the page, you know, short sentences, but if you're interested in more information, some of the things I have that, uh, but thank you, Christina, and thank you to everyone who, um, who uh, came today. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one. All right. Thank you.